Oh, never a dull moment in the National Football League. Hello and welcome into First Take. Appreciate you joining us alongside Skip Bayless and Stephen A. Smith, both in the house today, which is wonderful. I'm Molly Kerman. Peanut Tillman, Charles Peanut Tillman, will join us at the desk later on. Good morning, gentlemen. How you doing? I, well, I told him I couldn't do the handshake because I'm still sick. We appreciate that. That's right. We'll get you a little sanitizer. You, you came off as anything but sick during yesterday's show. Oh, yeah. I did what I had to you do. You did it. Brought it. We do appreciate it. Point right. made. Yes, for sure. All right, let's get right into that controversial call at the end of Monday Night Football in Seattle where the Seahawks get a three-point victory over the Lions. This is how the illegal bat rule works. It is an illegal bat if a player of either team bats or punches a loose ball that has touched the ground in any direction if it is in either end zone. It's a penalty if the foul is by the defense. It is an automatic first down. The penalty is not reviewable because it is a judgment call similar to pass interference. So another crazy ending skip for the Seahawks. Yep. How bad is this for the NFL? Stephen A. Smith and Molly. This was so bad to me when I saw it late last night that I immediately tweeted that for the NFL and for the Lions and their fans, this will be remembered as the bat out of hell play, okay. bat out of hell play. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to stick with that today because okay. after I slept on it, it's even worse than I first thought I like that it, it was. Mm -hmm. This is a terrible look for the NFL because remember the fail Mary play that happened in the same end zone. Remember that? Yeah. Of course. Was thanks to replacement refs. This was a real referee, and I'm going to use his name because we rarely call them out by name, yeah. named Greg Wilson, okay. eighth-year veteran, back judge, with a perfect view of this play. Am I right? He's, he's looking right yeah. down the line. Right he's, he's got it nailed. So either number one, he decided on the spur of the moment that this wasn't a blatant enough tap out of bounds to warrant a game deciding flag. Mm -hmm. Or number two, I'm just gonna throw this out because it happens, they're human. Number two, Greg Wilson might have been slightly intimidated enough by the crazy crowd called the Twelves that is Seattle's crowd that he started to go for it, flinched and thought, eh, I don't know if I can get away with that here in front of this crowd on this stage on Monday Night Football. Okay. Or number three, it's just possible that he didn't know or didn't remember a very obscure rule that rarely, rarely comes into play this way in this circumstance at this part of the field, which happened to be the end zone. Mm -hmm. But here's why Greg Wilson had to throw that flag. The ball, if you see on the replay, was bouncing slightly backward. It's an oblong ball. It takes odd bounces, as we know. So the trajectory is slightly backward toward K.J. Wright as he runs toward it okay. and then taps it out of bounds. That's big advantage to Seattle because, bear with me on this, what if he allows the ball to fall and bounce again? It could have bounced back into the end zone. And I'm going to remind everybody, it's a live football. It would be possible, it could even be probable, that somebody on the Lions would recover it in the end zone for a touchdown. That would certainly decide the game because Calvin Johnson almost <coughs> did before Cam Chancellor, and we'll talk about this in a minute, made a terrific, great play to knock it out of his hands. Mm -hmm. So this, the, the point here is the rule is in place to prevent exactly what K.J. Wright got away with doing. He didn't have to slug it out of bounds. He just tapped it out of bounds. That saved him from having to actually jump on the ball and recover it like a hand grenade in the end zone, right, to fall on top of it before a bunch of lions fell on top of it. Now, the two people I blame, I do blame the Detroit coaching staff, not just Jim Caldwell, but, but all of the ones up in the press box. They should have raised holy heck immediately. They should have all thrown fits. You've got to throw that flag at least to remind the head ref, uh, Tony Corinti, and the other ones to look around and say, wait a second, did we? maybe they sh should have, a, even though you can't review it because it's a judgment call, maybe they should at least get together at that point, but it would have to be sparked by the right. Detroit clo coaches right. to have a conference to say, did we get that right? right? Should we have looked at this a little differently? But in the end, I blame this referee for blowing this game that could have sent Seattle all the way down to one and three and sent them on their way to Cincinnati next Sunday. Mm -hmm. 4-0 Cincinnati at 1-3. Mm -hmm. I think it, this referee, whether he, he didn't mean to, obviously, right. it wasn't intentional, yeah. he saved Seattle's season. Let me say this to you, Skip Bayless. <clears throat> Absolutely correct 
on the call. No question about it. I totally agree with you. It was a blown call on the part of the referee. Mm -hmm. You've got Rule 12, Section 4, Article 1 of the 2015 rule book, NFL rule book. It specifically states it is an illegal bat if, A, any player bats or punches a loose ball in the field to play towards his opponent's goal line, which didn't apply here because it was in the end zone already, or B, any player bats or punches a loose ball that has touched the ground in any direction if it is in, in, in either end zone, yep. which is applicable here. It is. The fact is, the rule states it clearly. It was in clear violation by K.J. Wright. It should have been called. The Detroit Lions should have had the ball on their half-yard line in position to win the game. No question about it. But I put an equal amount of onus because I do understand that human error okay. is a part of the game. All right. But when you have Jim Caldwell and his entire coaching staff failing to raise holy hell mm -hmm. and forcing the officials to yeah. literally mingle yeah. with one another <laughs> just you know just get together and say okay we let's look at this let's let's make sure this, of this here and discuss it even if it's obviously yeah. at the discretion of the official and it's not deemed quote unquote reviewable the fact is you could get together you could huddle together and make the correction Good. because somebody can re, you can remind you of the rule that's in place you're the back judge you're supposed to know it but somebody next to you or somebody in the somebody. vicinity yes. may have known it and may have you're said right. look this is the rule boom but if you have no insistence on a part of the visiting team Yep. And no one is raising holy hell, yep. and that doesn't happen. Jim Caldwell, this, uh, you know, listen, despite the fact that Detroit is 0-4, they played hard most of this mm -hmm. season. They They've been highly they, competitive they, they have. most they, of this yeah. season, okay? So obviously, with Ndamukong Sue being gone, the mystique mm -hmm. of the team, and yep. You, yep. you clearly have lost something there. They are fighting. Mm -hmm. They are competing. And I give them a lot of credit. But this is one of those instances where, dare I say, the personality of Jim Caldwell actually worked, worked against him. It could. You know how they say Joe Cool? Well, I he's know. Jim Cool. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and being Jim, Jim Cool, cool. Yep. and not being somebody who raises holy hell. Yep. Maybe that played a role in the officials feeling it relatively easy yep. to shove him aside and say this is our call and that is it. And you know, from a basketball perspective, Skip, I remember years ago when Michael Jordan had retired. And Scottie Pippen and them came to Madison Square Garden. And the infamous Hugh Hollins, uh, you know, bogus call in yep, favor of Hugh Davis. Against, and, and Phil, it's, a, it's hard to imagine he's got bad hips and, you know, he can't I even know. be on the side. Because he that day he jumped up and down and was spinning around he, he and going crazy. Like, I can't believe how awful this call is. Yep. Guess what? To this very day, Skip, I am of the belief, as awful as that call was, if Phil Jackson didn't jump you know, jump around hooting and hollering mm -hmm. over how bogus that call was, yep. I don't think we would remember it nearly as much as we do to this very day. It was because of his reaction. And I bring that up to juxtapose it to Jim Caldwell, mm -hmm. and you're looking you know, for fire and brimstone. You know, this is a game on the line here. How the hell do you make this call? No, no, no. Raise holy hell. And he didn't do it. But in the end, here's what it comes down to more importantly. The officials, the coaches or for Detroit obviously all played a role. But the person who played the biggest role is a guy we once knew as Megatron. Mm. Because you can't lose that ball. Well, that's that a whole other issue. Yeah, but that's, that's true. It. You but can't lose true. that ball you can't in that lose particular ball. situation. And that I, I, it's the combination of all three things that lead us to this. Okay, point. quick quick thought on that since sure. you raised the issue. Do you blame Calvin or do you credit Cam for that play? I credit Cam. I credit Cam more than I blame Calvin, but I guess the reason why I'm blaming Calvin to some degree, Skip, is because it was a relatively pedestrian performance uh, uh, by him, and as far as I'm concerned, an anemic performance by that offense. Skip, they didn't do anything. The defense set up every point they had for yep. them last night. It was scored one touchdown, and the field goal, you guys, were, I mean, the, the defense put you in position for that. Their offense did nothing last night yep. and the one time they did do something about to finish off a 90-yard drive that play happens mm -hmm. so i mean that was the only thing they did effective all night and that was my problem okay i do not blame megatron at all for that play because he's trying to make a hero play he sees the goal line he's he got the ball in his left he didn't hand, extend it but, but he's starting to he's starting to extend yeah, that's the, fair. to that's get fair. the ball to the goal line and he gets blindsided. He didn't see Cam come from his back blindside to, to yeah, yeah, knock but, the but, ball but, but, out. Skip, you got time. 
You got time. Okay, you it's not like this yeah, is the last minute 51 game. Left. You yeah, it's a minute 51 okay, left. You got true. time. And if, right. if you protect the ball, especially against Seattle, they're piranhas. They are piranhas. Yeah. They go after know. it. No, they didn't have true. one sack last night. Not one sack, Swan, not one sack Skip, and their defense was still hellacious. It was. This is who they are. Yeah. They're, they're piranhas. They're all over you. You have to protect that football. Okay, back to the Jim Caldwell issue. Should he have known? It sounded to me like in Pete Carroll's post-game press conference, he did not know the rule. It's possible because yeah. this is obscure. I, you know, I've been watching this game for a long time, covering it for a long time. I can't ever remember this rule coming into play like that. So it's also possible that Jim Caldwell just wasn't aware of the rule. That's fine. Yes. That's fine. It's also forgivable. But let's be clear. Skip Bayless is a journalist. And a pundit yeah. and a commentator. And the, the, this is Jim job. Caldwell yeah. is the head coach. Yeah, right. That's your job. No, I know. Now, it I is, mean, it don't get me wrong. I understand it. I understand it. It's forgivable because it's an obscure play. You don't see that very often. Okay. Nevertheless, it's your, the, 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 the great ones know. know it. Okay. The great ones would know. All right. Just to differentiate for our viewers. Okay. And I'm not saying I don't know because I don't know if Jim Caldwell doesn't know or not. Okay. No, I don't either. But right. the only time I ever see this kind of rule come into play is usually when a punter muffs the snap near the goal line and it goes back in the end zone. Right. And you see the punter run after the ball. Mm -hmm. He doesn't bat it. He just kicks it out of bounds for a safety. Yep. Right? Yes. Go ahead. But here's the flip side. That is even more of, an ex uh, a more of a reason why you should know the rule. Because if it's applicable to a punter, for example, okay. or a kicker, then to some, to, in some way, shape, form, or fashion, it may be applicable to this. Okay, to but the here's players. the but nuance. you got to know that. Okay, it's the punter's the ball. He's in possession of the ball. It's your, your ball on offense, mm -hmm. and you're going to punt it, mm -hmm. and it's still in his possession, and he kicks it out the back end of the end zone, and it's a two-point safety. Now, uh, again, uh, Jerry Austin was asked after the game, our, our ex-ref mm -hmm. uh, analyst on ESPN, okay, why doesn't a safety also carry the five-yard penalty? Because it should be a penalty plus a safety. And I think if I understood Jerry right, that it's, it's already penalty enough. You're going to lose two points, and you're going to have to punt the ball as a kickoff back to the other team. Okay, remember, in this case, it was different because it's nobody's ball. It's a loose football. It's actually Detroit's ball, and you're knocking it. It's still in Detroit's possession, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. the defense knocks it out of bounds. Right. So that's, but that's a different spin on the— Yeah, it's slightly you know, different, but remember, you said it's a live ball. So if it's a live ball, then it's anybody's. Okay. It's anybody's. The last touch, last in the possession of Detroit. Detroit. So the defense doesn't want anybody to recover it, so you just knock it out That's of bounds right. so that you end the play with a touchback, mm -hmm. which, which would go out to the 20-yard line, which it did, as opposed to having to fall on the ball and control the ball in the end zone, which the rule forces you to do. You can't just knock it or kick it or whatever you want to do to get it out of right. bounds. You have to possess the ball in the end zone for you to take it back out to the 20. And this is too easy. And I know he didn't, like, punch the ball out of bounds. Right. He just patty caked the ball yeah, out of bounds. Right. And maybe that fooled the referee like, boy, that wasn't too blatant or egregious. It was blatant. Okay, it but it is blatant. blatant. It, was it is. Blatant. You saved yourself having to recover the football. Yeah. Okay. I Bottom line, that. it was a bad call, and Seattle got lucky. It was, oh. a, bad, it was a bad lucky. Day. Right. Well, Seattle, Seattle, got lucky. Seattle, Seattle got lucky, but Cam Chancellor, that wasn't a lucky play. No, nope. we're going to get into that right now. So the Seahawks are now two and two, and as Stephen A. just mentioned, Seattle is not allowed a touchdown in their last 18 regular season quarters with Cam Chancellor on the field. Stephen A. Going into the season, you had Seattle as your Super Bowl pick. Now, through four games, has your opinion changed at all seeing this? Team well, it hasn't more? changed, but I'm not as resolute in that opinion as I was at the beginning of this season. And the reason why is because of their offense. I picked this team to win the Super Bowl championship for two reasons. That elite defense, the Mark. Legion of Boom, yep. mm -hmm. you know, and all its supplementary parts, the defensive line and so on and so forth. Also, their motivation, because no matter how motivated the New England Patriots are due to deflate gate and the whole fiasco that that entailed, mm -hmm. the bottom line is yep. they stand here today as the reigning defending Super Bowl champions. Yep. And the Seattle Seahawks sit here today as a team who believes it was theirs and their head coach gave it away by not giving the ball a beast mode a half yard away from the goal line. 
It is that simple. So I believe the combination of how elite their defense is, Skip, and how motivated they are to resurrect themselves and to make and to make amends for what transpired, basically taking back what they believe yep. belongs to them. The Seattle Seahawks believe they should be standing here right now as the reigning two-time defending Super Bowl champions, yep. okay? And they believe that it was they, they gave that away. So they believe it's theirs. That is the reason I picked them. Mm-hmm. The fact that you got this offense with Jimmy Graham, yeah. which I believe wait, is a wait, is he that better. That experiment is or, not you, working. Wait, is he a Seahawk now or not? Yes. Listen, is he, the, the, does he dress? This guy had, it's unbelievable. Well, he had four catches for maker. 29 yards last night. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying that it's so anemic. It's so pedestrian. It's so blah, blah. I can't believe it. Now, in defense... Detroit was all over Russell Wilson. I mean, he was running for his life yeah. most of the game. They, they sacked him six times. I can't even count how many times they pressured them. They were all over him. And if it wasn't for his elusivity, yep. his, 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 you know, it, that's what Clay Matthews meant when he told Colin Kaepernick, you are no Russell Wilson. Because you got to remember, Kaepernick is more like RG3, the old RG3, in terms of he could fly north mm-hmm. and south. That is true. He, is, he can't juke you the nope. way that Russell Wilson yep. is capable of juking you. So that's probably what Clay Matthews meant. And be, it meant, and it, it, it definitely highlighted itself because they were all over Russell Wilson last night, okay? And they, I mean, it, he could barely breathe. Mm-hmm. But I'm still looking at them. And, and again, and no Marshawn, Marshawn, Lynch, yep. Marshawn B. Smoke, yep. he didn't play last night, so we understand that. I'm just looking at this offense, and I'm like, my God, what has happened to y'all? They can't win the Super Bowl with their offense doing as little as they did last night. Granted, Beast Mode didn't play, yep. but they cannot do as much as they did last night yep. and win the Super Bowl. They're still my pick, yep. but their offense has got to play better because they, this defense is a Super Bowl caliber defense. No okay. question. And their motivation is Super Bowl caliber motivation. But their offense the has to jo- their offense has to join the party, and that's not happening yet. I'm with you. I don't want to go in too hard on that offense because there was no Marshawn. Yep. That's right. But in a showcase Monday night football game, you scored 13 at home, and you allowed Matt Stafford, who hadn't been able to do squat against your defense, to drive 90, almost 91 yards with, what was it, 623 remaining. That's right. That's a long drive, and you gave up a big play to Golden Tate and one to the expatriate Tim Wright right down the yep. seam, and Cam said, they fooled me with that one. I didn't see that one coming on tape. Okay, but you get it down to within striking distance, and from the 11-yard line, you hit Calvin Johnson, and it looked like, for all the world, he was about to score, and you were about to be in big trouble, even though there was time, there had been a minute 45 left for Russell Wilson. Now. Is that on the defense? A little bit. I, I saw a little little crack in the foundation there that you gave that up at home in front of that crowd. Right. But back to Russell Wilson. The, the whole offense revolves around a little guy, and he's, I, don't, I don't usually say little guy, but he's a little guy by NFL standards. He's, what is he, about 5'11", 5'10 Quarterback and a half. standards for yeah, sure, one right? of the shortest. And, and Stephen A., to your point, his, his quickness and his downfield speed is staggering to me. It looks he he looks quicker than ever. Last night he did because he had that one great escape in the first half. No one can do what he's been doing on escape plays and and then able to throw on the run, running the wrong way. He's running to his left and throws a big completion. But it's it's a high wire act. And he fumbled twice that hurt them badly. They lost the turnover battle three to one and yeah. still won the game at home. That yeah. you know that's that's pretty great. And yet Russell Wilson, if you force him to stand there in that pocket at his diminutive diminutive size, he can't see it, and, and he's not consistently accurate from the pocket. He's, to me, to my eye, he is below average as a pure pocket passer. But if he gets outside, he is absolutely lethal, as lethal as I've ever seen of anybody outside. He's what Johnny Manziel hopes he can one day become. Because he's doing better than, you know, he is, he's Russell football. That's who he is. Because that's, he's making plays. And at one point, Gruden said last night, boy, he, he better not keep doing this because at some point it's going to catch up with him. But he keeps pulling it off. And you I got to give it to it's him. It's interesting. He does keep pulling it off. You know what? As I watched Russell Wilson last night, you know what I said to myself? A 3-4 defense is the best way to go against him. Let me explain why. 
it's almost best that you don't have a pass rush. You don't need that to. That you just keep you him just, in the pocket. Don't let him that out. You just, keep, just don't let him out well, of the pocket. I know. That's all. I agree. That's it. Because the more people you send, if he somehow is able to escape, yeah, because you're you 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 you're trying to you're trying to put forth a vicious pass rush. He's gonna eat you up because he has that elusivity factor he working does. in his favor. And again, once he gets out of the pocket, he's lethal. But even if he has time, if you make him stand in the pocket mm-hmm. and there are bodies in front of him to impede his vision, yep. it obviously affects him like it would affect anybody else who's relatively short yep. inside that pocket. To me, that's the best way to neutralize him. And then, to, and then, and this is why Jimmy Graham and Lockett, it doesn't make much sense right now. They're both huge targets. Mm-hmm. So when all else fails, particularly with a quarterback like Russell Wilson, yep. because of his diminu- diminutive mm-hmm. style, yep. uh, size, mm-hmm. you can throw it up sometimes, sometimes. And just throw it in the vicinity. Yep. And they should be able to go and get it for you. The fact that none of that is happening nope. is incredibly alarming to me. This offense has become a huge question mark. I can't believe it's going to stay this way because you got enough weapons to lock it and grab with beast mode. The offensive line played even yesterday. They can play better, and I believe they will play better. And Russell Wilson obviously can be evasive, but they're going to have to do that to capture a Super Bowl championship. Yep. They're going to have to do that to beat Green Bay. Yep, they're going to have you. to do that to beat Arizona. Yep. Right now, they're asking a whole lot of little Russell Wilson to make a couple plays a game that's going to win the game 13-10. Mm-hmm. to 10. Yeah. So, Stephen A., you have him going to the Super Bowl, not as strong on it. Skip, you say not so much. <sighs> I, well, you know who I picked. Oh, yeah. That was Cowboys. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm hanging in, so, but some it's going to be happen. a long road. Some yes. happen with that team. Yeah. All right, that's a whole other story, though. So there are now six undefeated teams left in the NFL. How would you list the Patriots, Falcons, Panthers, Bengals, and Packers from best to worst? Send us your rankings on Twitter using the hashtag RankTheUnbeatens. Meanwhile, Stephen A. had some strong words on Texas's Charlie Strong future on Mike and Mike and on his radio show. We'll discuss the next move for the Longhorns. That's after the break. 